If we look at the world, we can see many things cause suffering. There are natural evils and there are human and moral evils. Now, natural evils are those things that humans do not directly bring about themselves. So we can consider things like death, we will all grow old and die. We can consider things like disease, we can consider pain, we can consider earthquakes, volcanoes, forest fires, tsunamis. On top of that, there are also human and moral evils, and those are evils that bring about suffering, and these evils are the result of human choices. So there is racism, prejudice, discrimination, war, crime. All these things bring about suffering, and all of these things are the result of human choice. So that brings us to the problem of evil. First of all, if God is good, he would not want us to suffer. If God is all-powerful, he could stop suffering. But there is suffering. So, that would be evidence that there is no God. How can there be a God if he would want to stop suffering, if he could stop suffering, but he doesn't stop suffering? Is there a problem of evil? Do Christians and other people who believe in God have an answer to the problem of evil? Well, let's start by asking a few questions. First of all, would God want to end all suffering everywhere immediately? Well, a saying that many athletes have is no pain, no gain. So some people actually get a tremendous sense of achievement through overcoming pain. Doctors, nurses, curs can use pain to learn compassion. In fact, we can all learn compassion through looking at suffering and working to help others overcome the suffering that they're experiencing. Firefighters, soldiers, policemen, mountain climbers, many people look at suffering in the face, look death in the face, and accept the challenge and overcome it, learning courage. And then we can also look at compassion, forgiveness, love. All of those things would not exist if there was not suffering. If there wasn't pain, we couldn't learn to be brave, we could not learn to be determined, we could not learn to be compassionate, we could not learn to forgive. So maybe God would not want to end all suffering because some greater goods would not exist unless there was suffering in the world. In other words, If God were to end all suffering, all pain, we would lose many, many things that we value. Could God end all suffering without losing some greater good like free will or love? So the first part of the problem of evil said God would want to end all suffering. The second prong of the problem of evil is that God could stop all suffering. But could God stop all suffering without losing some greater good? God can do anything which is possible, which would make sense. But God cannot make a triangle with four sides. That's just a nonsense statement. It doesn't describe anything that God can do because the definition of a triangle is it has three sides. So when you're studying omnipotence and God's power, when you're looking at the nature of God, you look that God being all-powerful means that God can bring about any sensible state of affairs that he wants to bring about. But that does not mean that God can give us free will and responsibility. And it does not mean that love can be possible if he doesn't make suffering possible. First of all, think about free will. If there are no consequences for our actions, we cannot learn responsibility. Free will is absolutely meaningless if there are no consequences for our actions. If you take a risk, then there's a chance you could be hurt. Furthermore, love itself seems to require the possibility of loss. Because love is not measured purely in what you feel. It is not measured even mainly in what you feel. Love describes how much you value another person. 
And if you're not prepared to risk loss, and if you're not prepared to make sacrifices, then you do not love another. Without the possibility of suffering, without the possibility of loss, we would not have love, not as we understand it. So if God removed all suffering from the world, it is possible that we would lose free will and responsibility and we would also lose love. We would lose a lot of the things that make life meaningful. Many of the things that make our lives meaningful and that make our lives seem worthwhile are only possible because we live in a world where suffering is at least possible. Some suffering serves a higher purpose. But is all suffering like that? Aren't there examples of needless evils, or what we might call gratuitous evils, evils that don't serve any purpose at all? A famous example is a, a baby deer caught in a forest fire. Isn't there just a little too much suffering in the world? Consider that baby deer. Wouldn't it be possible that God could intervene now and then to save a few more fawns from forest fires without losing any greater good? What greater good would be lost if God stepped in now and then and saved a few innocent animals miraculously? But if God continually intervened to undo every instance of suffering, that seemed needless, we would be living in a magical world in which miracles happened to undo suffering or to prevent suffering, and then we couldn't predict what the outcomes would be to our actions. If we're to have responsibility and free will, we need to know that some of our actions will probably have good consequences and that some of our actions will probably have painful consequences for others and we need to be able to choose between the two and we need to look at the world and understand that our world works in a certain way that certain events cause pain and suffering and that certain events bring about life and joy and we need to learn the difference between the two so that we can choose as individuals and that's how we learn compassion and bravery and that is how we learn responsibility once God starts intervening to undo suffering which seems pointless to us at the time he'll be doing that continually and we will not learn any of the good things that we need to learn like compassion and we would not have responsibility and we would have meaningless lives we also need to keep in mind that just because we cannot see how a greater good could emerge from a situation, just because we cannot think of any good which would justify a particular act of suffering, that does not mean we are right. Scientists can use instruments to detect all sorts of things that we can't see with our eyes. It is just possible that God might be smarter than our smartest scientists. It is just possible that God might know of reasons which justify particular instances of suffering that we don't know about, that we can't imagine, that we might not be able to work out. So simply because we can't see how a particular instance of suffering would be justified, it doesn't mean we are right. God might be able to see something that we cannot. But aren't there instances of suffering that are so horrendous that they would seem to render a person's life completely meaningless? Someone who lost their entire family, their entire nation, in the Holocaust could justifiably feel that way. Don't those horrendous evils count as evidence against God's existence? Isn't God meant to love each individual human person and want to give that person a good life? Don't horrendous evils argue strongly against God's existence? 
Well, there's a couple of things to notice about horrendous evils. First of all, they stand out, they aren't the norm. We notice them because they are so terrible compared to other people's lives. Most people, most of the time, judge their lives to be good overall. They would state that they are happy. And most people who aren't happy or who do not think that their lives are currently good can see a way out of their situation and believe that happiness for them is possible and happiness is worth fighting for. People who have endured horrendous evils and cannot even imagine a world in which they might even possibly be happy again are thankfully comparatively few. And that strongly suggests that good outweighs the evil in the world. Good is the norm. The things that make us happy are the norm. Our lives overall can be meaningful. Evil is the exception. It is rarer than what is good. Second, it is true that some evil seems so devastating that a person might give up hope of ever being happy in this world again, in this life. But the key terms there are this world, this life. If there is a God, there can be an afterlife. There can be a new creation and a different world. So who knows what sort of good things there could heal a person and restore their happiness. In Christianity, love is what we all long for. Love is what we all desire. And the lack of love is what leads to suffering. It's not simply physical pain. It's not simply grief. It's the absence of love. In Christianity, when you die, if you want to be with God, if you surrender your life to him, you will have that love forever. So at the very least, everyone has the choice, the chance to live a meaningful life filled with an eternity of love. So if there is a God, it is possible that these lives which seem to be overwhelmed with evil can be healed, restored, cured and made meaningful in an afterlife. So while gratuitous evils or needless evils and horrendous evils seem to offer some evidence against God's existence, they by no means prove that God does not exist.